Hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on your information governance plan stalling, five things you need for the secret sauce. I'm Teresa Resick and I'm the Director of Market Intelligence Programs here at AIM and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And joining me today are AIM President Peggy Winton and we also have Ian Robert Moran from Access. And Access is the underwriter of today's webinar and we thank them very much for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Just as we get started, just want to offer a few tips for participating in today's webinar. By joining live, you can resize the different windows in front of you. And, uh, and across the bottom of your screen are a list of icons that have some additional features for you uh, to participate. And one of those is group chat. And you'll need to click that so that you can message with each other and also with a few of us here at AIM. I also encourage you to download the resources that we have for you. And uh, do ask questions of the speakers using the Q&A feature. And we'll do our best to get to all of those questions later in the webcast. And I would also greatly appreciate it if you would take the feedback survey. I do value what you have to say. And uh, so and that is in a link across the bottom. And that link will also open uh, when the webinar concludes. And this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. And right now I'd like to introduce the speakers that we have with us today. And Peggy Winton is the President of AIM, and she has over 30 years of program, product, and business development experience. And Peggy is responsible for the strategic, technical, and business direction of AIM. Peggy believes that marketing and technology are converging and moving to the forefront of the business in order to deliver the ultimate customer experience. And with this, businesses need to adapt to a world that has shifted from physical to data, technology, and automation. And then also joining us uh, today from Access is Ian Robert Moran, and he is the VP of Business Development. And, uh, and in our conversations with him leading up to this, he has some really cool information to share about information governance. And so I look forward to his joining our conversation here. But for now, I'm going to turn things over to Peggy Winton to begin our discussion today. Peggy? Well, Teresa, thank you so much, and thanks for all of you who have tuned in. I hope you like our cover slide and that amazingly unctuous-looking tomato sauce we've got on there. I'm sure some of you are tuning in over lunchtime and uh, your stomachs are rumbling. Um, Delicious and sought after is not exactly what information governance has historically uh, been viewed as. For way too long, I think, information governance has been looked at by organizations as something almost more akin to good hygiene or eating more fiber or eating kale. Um, have you seen the bumper sticker that says something like, I ate more kale? nothing happened. Um, perhaps that's how uh, some of you are viewing information governance. But it's, it's largely been seen as, as something you do but isn't necessarily pleasant. Our recent AIM research points to a shift in this uh, mentality and in the importance that organizations are finally placing on effective information governance. In fact, um, 73% of the organizations we polled view information governance as important or critical to their business strategy. So that's really uh, a shift and it's really exciting. This is probably a good point to welcome you, Ian Robert, and ask you, is there anything you can point to uh, for the shift is it simply a recognition and reaction to the exploding volume and variety of information we're all feeling coming into our organizations? Sure. Or is it caused by the attention garnered by new and sweeping regulations like GDPR and CCPA? Is it something else? What, what do your clients tell you? Thanks, Peggy. And uh, I, I will uh, just say out loud, I am alone in the room. If there's another voice, it's my rumbling tummy from that uh, tomato sauce picture. So let me apologize, uh, apologize in advance. Um, 
Yeah, it, I think it's a very interesting time for managing and using information. Um, I think it's definitely part of what you said. Uh, the acceleration of the amount of information, though, not so new. The possibility of legal and compliance risk associated with information is not so new and so on. But things are coming together, and the sauce they make is interesting. I think among several aspects, four really stand out from my recent client experience. Large changes in technology, the shift in perspective from records management to information governance, devastating giant scale hacks, and significant social awareness of privacy have accelerated the shift from should do to must do. First, it's the technology domino. Technology is changing the cost and the ability to make data you have useful. This in turn is driving ways to use the data to improve business outcomes. That makes digital transformation attainable. And so digital transformation requires proper information governance. Now it's a must do. Data that might have been good to have information but was trapped in paper documents are now able, able to be classified, indexed, found, and matched with other data quickly to create real value. Technology is also changing the game on what was a paralyzing amount of information to be net managed. Quite simply, technology is not afraid of the amount of data. Changes in technology affecting capture, access, and use is a disruptor. Another aspect is the perspective and or responsibility of understanding and managing information. It has shifted with the broadening roles now involved in information governance from what was often a potential silo of records management. Cross-functional executives are now playing roles in setting priorities for information governance, and they use it to enhance their world or to do their part to manage the risk for their company. I would say lastly, it's the connection of high profile hacks and growing privacy expectations showcased by well publicized regulations. You, you mentioned GDPR. These are all contributing to a greater real and perceived awareness of the risk of not having strong information governance. Security and addressing privacy are at the forefront of concerns for most senior leaders responsible for information. And with the broad holistic teams that are now coming with the paradigm of information governance, that really means just about everyone. I think those are really good points. And what strikes me, Ian Robert, is that these are opportunities. They're also challenges. But you're right. I mean, never before have we had such computing power that can automate a lot of this. And so many of our line of business owners who would never be considered uh, records or documents mm -hmm. or compliance specialists are um, suddenly involved in all this. And I think that's a great, it's a great thing and it's a great democratization. So I think those are really good points for everybody to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we go through this. But, you know, the term, the very term information governance is still misunderstood by a lot of organizations and or the people within those. But for years, we've witnessed this sort of tuggle, this battle between giving access and control when it comes to user demand. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of pressure now from the business users. Why? Because they're on the front line with their customers and their customers are demanding access. And, you know, now we're not just creators of content, we're consumers and we're brokers of that content. And we're opening that whole process up to our customers as well. So the age-old <laughs> access versus control uh, is something that I think really plays a role in all of this as well. For sure. So here's a little, here's a little question uh, we'll ask of you all. Um, information management professionals are still struggling with getting executive and stakeholder buy-in. Um, despite those four very compelling points that Ian Robert just shared, um, there's a large percentage of organizations that say their C-level executives are not engaged at all or only 
somewhat engaged when it comes to information governance. Wonder if there's any any guesses on what that might be. Well, it's a full 73%. That's huge. I think that that has to do with the fact that many of us in this industry have probably spent far too much time figuring out how to hang on to our information, how to control it. But now it's time to set it free uh, for those customer facing and customer experience drivers that I just mentioned. Um, and, and the power that information has to truly uh, contribute to innovation and creativity and disruption. So I think it's time for us to let go somewhat, um, let information go to work for us as we fulfill that number one digital transformation aspiration of delighting our customers. I think we need to change the conversations about governance. We need to stop talking about uh, governance for governance sake or how the sausage is made and instead focus on the mission critical output from our information. I think that's what gets our executives excited. And we had a, um, a, a close, close friend of AIM who was with Farmers Insurance. He's since uh, gone on to uh, join his own uh, or, or, or found a consulting uh, organization based on privacy and security. But he was part of a project for an in-car diagnostic about driver safety. And that's, as you can imagine, a big initiative that a lot of the car the automobile insurance companies are embracing. And Raphael said, you know what, if I called this an information governance or a privacy project, I would have completely lost the opportunity to engage with my customers, have them engage with me, and get executive support for what we're doing. He said, instead, I just gave up the idea that people would care about governance and instead talked about the outputs. And I said that this is going to improve driver safety. And oh, by the way, it just happens to have governance and privacy built in. <laughs> And I think that's a really important lesson for all of us. So, Ian Robert, you've got to be experiencing this kind of yeah. frustration all the time when you meet with executives in customer organizations. Are there certain buttons you push or you find are more successful in getting the executives to uh, really change their perception of governance as a, from a cost of doing business to a strategic business enabler? Absolutely, absolutely, and I, I think it's involved in this in the shift we, we talked about up above, Peggy. One common thread for years in selling executives on a recommended records management change has been avoidance of negatives. Uh, we used to call it in one company I was at the ponking, so the price of nonconformance, and we really positioned mm -hmm. that negative. Um, uh, as why we needed to do something different. And um, the challenge is when cost of noncompliance are very vague or they're not really perceived uh, as an organizational threat, using that punk or price of nonconformance or the negative side of it, it really foils the ROI calculations. It, they, they won't make sense. Um, so IG isn't just managing risk. It is about treating information as an asset. It's about understanding what is important to the client's business. If we can reduce the risk associated with managing information in a way that creates more efficiency so that people are more productive, executives will listen. Aligning IG with information security and privacy will also help business leaders view it as a business enabler. One thing I've seen effective with executives um, is also when they're being asked to fund a change, it's focus on a specific business goal, how it can be affected by a change, and what the return would be. Attempts to boil the ocean and calculate ROI based on fear, especially in non-regulated industries. Let me, let me throw that out there. Especially in non-regulated industries, it won't work. Find a process that would be made better and yield more uh, returns, um, and you will uh, you will find a way uh, to get a win. And when you get wins, then with your executives, you can go bigger. 
Well, you've obviously gotten completely uh, under the covers of our recent research, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> and I should stop here and, and, and remind our audience that AIM does come out to all of you on a very regular basis. And thank you so much for any of you that do participate in our research efforts, because we ask you collectively about your drivers on things like this, and we collate everything and we provide analysis. And this is what you said. So 38% of you, I think, are still um, used to playing on that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I love punking. That's going to be a new phrase, Ian Robert, I'm adopting. I really, really like that. Um, but that 38% of, um, you know, reducing information risk and compliance concerns, even cutting, cutting across multiple departments, 38% of you are, are, are still um, using that. And, and again, that's, I think, where historically our crowd has played. Interestingly, and to your point, Ian Robert, we, we, we brought in a brand powerhouse at AIM recently to do some workshops for us, again, to try to help articulate our practice to uh, executives and, and focusing on that strategic business differentiator versus just, you know, Debbie Downer cost of doing business. And he made a point <laughs> that, that, uh, that really uh, enhances what you said. And he said, why would you want your brand to be affiliated with fear and right. doubt? <laughs> And, and I think that's a really great point. So turn things around. 36% of you, and this is growing, um, are saying exactly that, that if you align this with mission critical and specific business um, uh, resolution of problems and, and can provide proof points as to how information, sound information governance contributes, then you've got a conversation. And I predict that when we are talking about this topic this time next year and revisiting these um, these data points, uh, they, that 36% will significantly increase. So while information governance professionals have been pretty successful in getting better at explaining that link between all the information flowing into their organizations and the compliance and legal risks this information carries, they really can be instrumental in advancing a bigger play. And that's exactly what we've said, making that connection between IG and strategy. So Ian Robert and I want to take you through what we see are the five ingredients for taking your information governance efforts to the next level with a strategy story. So if there were a strategy in spaghetti sauce, um, this is sort of what, what it would be. So let's let's start with the first uh, the first of the five ingredients. Build a successful cross-functional governance team. You cannot do this by yourself. You need these different people and you need these different perspectives to really drive change and most importantly to sustain that improvement. Um, governance is long languished, I think, in just IT or legal, but nearly every department has a stake here. Uh, business units, certainly legal, um, even marketing and sales. And, you know, these are just a few of the stakeholders who should have an interest in how critical information is stored, used, and managed. And when we look at top performing organizations, um, we find that assembling that cross-functional steering committee is an important factor for success. Some are even building in some incentives so that it, it maybe nudges uh, people who uh, don't view IG as their primary job to get involved. And team members then can really shepherd the implementation and ensure that the techniques found valuable in one process are actually replicated across the organization. And I think that's what you said earlier. You know, you want to start small, um, tackle something that's doable but not trivial, and then really trumpet that success. And the focus should be mm -hmm. on illustrating the business effect that IT can have. Um, you know, in fact, getting business users on the team, I think, is probably pretty wise. But from a functional role, Ian Robert, what are some of the key players you've seen um, that really comprise a, an ideal blended information governance team? 
Sure. Listen, I, I think that, you know, organizations are, you know, collections of people. They're entities uh, in their own right. And so their business purposes are different and the players on the teams are different and the organizational structure that they have are, are, are different. And so the, the ideal team's got to be matched to the organization. And, and I would say don't underestimate the importance of, 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 of a person or really a few strong leaders uh, in, in an organization that will help drive the initiative. You, you, really, you really need that. So I, I, I think it has to be tailored. We can talk about, you know, the obvious ones. I think we have IT, um, uh, whether they want to be, uh, you know, in this new, new world kind of front and center or not, just the way data and the tools have come about, you know, IT is definitely there, uh, and you can't get away from legal and compliance. But to your points, Peggy, I, I really think you hit it on the head. Um, involving the people who um, use the data, who protect the data, um, and who have to deal with the impact uh, to the company's brand when there's a breakdown, um, involving those people in the play, huge. Um, so, you know, some, some newer kind of uh, roles perhaps, uh, marketing even, and, uh, and companies that are, you know, having security um, be, be filled out as a, as a department and sitting in at the play um, involving security for sure. Um, operations and the users are key. Um, they're going to be feeding, um, you know, what's actually happening, and they're going to drive that balance um, as well between what they need as the consumers and the users with what responsibilities they have to help protect, manage, and ensure that the data coming in has all the necessary information um, to be able to manage it, use it, and dispose of it at the end of its life cycle. So it's it's going to be tailored. It needs to be broad, and there has to be a few a few really strong players in that specific organization to uh, to bring it home. Uh, you are so right. I mean, I think uh, GDPR really brought out the marketing folks because mm -hmm. most of them own the customer. Uh, and they mm -hmm. were never charged with really thinking about what that meant in terms of protection, and they certainly do now. And you're also right about the line of business and the process owners. I always say, you know, who better than the process owners to know how a process should work or what processes need to be uh, in place? <laughs> um, and oftentimes we, we forget to consult them. And when it comes to the information that enables them to do a better job and to serve their customers better, yeah, they, they, they have an interest and they should get involved. So thank you for that. The, the second ingredient is, you know, kind of a, kind of a duh. You kind of have to audit the information you got. You can't very well manage what you don't know you have, but nobody says that's going to be easy. Um, we talk a lot about the fact that the volume, velocity, and variety of information that's, you know, coming into most of our organizations, we need to manage it, store it, and protect it. It now exceeds our ability to even marginally keep pace. I think University of California at Berkeley loves to try to keep pace with the size or volume of information. It's already in the what is it, zettabytes or something. I don't know about you, but, you know, I've long since lost the ability to, 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 to manage that. And we asked you all, we said, look at your own organizations and think of the volume of information that's coming in. How much do you think it's going to grow in just two years? Um, and from X, it, but you told us it's going to be almost five times um, over the next two years, and you expect that a full 60% of that is going to be unstructured, like a contract or a conversation. And we've made that distinction in this industry and at AIM for many, many years. Yes, it's becoming blurred, but unstructured adds that extra element of challenge. Why? Because you can't put um, the power of some of these AI tools um, and machine learning tools if it's completely unstructured. So that does add uh, mm -hmm. an extra rub 
So, all right, Ian Robert, given the staggering amount of information that's swirling around our organizations, you know, how in the world do we take stock? What are, what are the steps you say yeah. and, and walk, walk your customers through in discovering what they have? Yeah, Peggy, this for this has to be a consultative approach. So either from a an advisor, an external advisor helping a company or an internal player who's taking this this challenge on um, as you're working through the the lines of business and the various elements of the company it has to be a consultative approach. You, you have to have methodologies and best practices and you know tested solutions that you prefer, those are certainly all key. You have to have those, but really the path has to be determined by, by the client needs or the client goals. And you, you also can't escape the importance of how the client views their current state. And when I say client, I mean the organization at large or even within a department. When you're trying to affect change, you have to understand where, where how they view their current state. So. Do they think everything is great? Well, that's going to drive a different approach and a path. Um, do they think everything is broken? Well, that that clearly is something something different, you know. Or perhaps they're just exiting from a very damaging outcome uh, related to a breakdown in how they're governing their information, and they vowed never to go through that uh, again. Th- there again, that that's going to allow for or create a different path. So client orientation and the desired end state are really going to drive the path, the solution, and especially the timeline. There's there's really just no silver bullet. Um, I will say as a concept that we have, um, you know, step one is, is probably to understand or admit there's a problem and then prioritize how to bring order to the chaos. So, uh, we're having conversations with our clients about looking at technology as, as an ecosystem. How do we connect the right solutions um, through integration and then take advantage of AI and machine learning to classify um, data, attack the unstructured data, and then apply the proper information governance policy? We might receive documents from an origination system and that same document might be sitting in a file share, um, and it might be called something else. And then that same document might be in the document management system our client acquired through an acquisition. So we work with the client to bring all those documents together under one naming convention um, so we can help them bring order to the chaos. I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, machine learning um, because, again, that's where we can get out of the the um, pipe dream of managing these things manually and really get some heavy lifting. We asked you all, do you agree or disagree with this statement? We feel confident that we can identify what is safe to delete. And our third ingredient here is get rid of the rot, delete the rot. And you all know what that acronym stands for. It's redundant, obsolete, and trivial. Um, It's been overused, but I think if you stop and think about each of those redundant, how many different versions of the documents do you have? There's technology that's been around with us for a long time. It's very mature, and it'll help you do that. Um, Obsolete, you know, we are just terrible about hanging on to things that we just don't need anymore. Um, Hello, that leisure suit that's still in your closet. Um, You're not, you're not wearing that again. Um, And then trivial, Um, you know, again, how many organizations have emails that say things like, Hey, everyone, there's cookies in the kitchen. Uh, You don't need to be hanging on (laughs) to that. And, you know, we're making progress here. Why? Because we're realizing finally that while the cost per gig, let's say, of storage is cheap, the compounded cost is not. Now, that goes to those fears of e-discovery, but that's obviously not the only reason. So, Ian, Robert, again, what are your customers um, thinking about as to 
what can they do? What can they responsibly delete and do so automatically if possible? Sure. So I'm going to start with um, information in physical form and then talk about it in um, in, in digital form. So there, there are still many, many businesses out there with legacy paper archives and a few of those with little or no metadata to drive the disposition calls. So uh, for, for our clients through our FileBridge records management system, uh, we help clients um, create, enter, and then apply their retention schedule to their physical documents. Um, we allow them to set required entry fields when creating those physical documents. So we create masking on, on those to ensure that there's proper uh, data capture and the metadata um, is there as they create new inventory. We help them manage the inventory, receive reports for disposition, and then um, at the appropriate time, uh, complete, uh, complete the destruction of those. For those who've made decisions to get clean, uh, we help them use data to identify those pockets in their collection that they don't have the metadata to make the disposition call on, and then we make the decisions. And where the data just simply, there's no logic or defensible uh, data, then we will um, help them do a physical audit of, um, of the uh, records so that we can help them achieve um, disposition. So FileBridge and its components allow our clients to see physical and digital files in the same query and action a common uh, disposition. It also supports um, our clients managing physical and digital records at their locations or other third-party storage vendors all in one view. This is huge for applying destruction deletion disposition, but it's also great for managing legal holds. So. On the digital side, when we're talking about deleting uh, information, um, Access provides our clients the ability to apply their retention schedules in a way that enables automated defensible deletion. So the um, one example uh, of our technology is we're helping clients manage employee documents and we integrate with their HRIS system, which is their system of record for employee data. We automatically receive the data, um, so let's use termination date as an example, and that in turn may start the clock ticking on a common retention rule, um, which let's say that's seven years after termination date. So th through our acquisition of Montanian Associates and the integration of LexiTrack into our technology platform, we can help clients develop retention schedules and then push that data um, into our technology or others that they may already have in place. So as we've noted, automating the execution of decisions is ideal, and that, that's what we're striving for. And that brings us to our fourth ingredient, and that is set, run, and automate. Not only those processes, like Ian Robert just said, but also your policies. It, let's face it, we humans are lousy at doing things like tagging and dragging. We don't want to do it. Who does? And we don't always make the right choices. So we recently asked you, what do you see as the three biggest issues in enforcing and creating and enforcing an information policy. And look at the top three, having the right people at the table, enforcing it once it's completed, translating the policies into system rules. Um, look at them. What what do all three of these top and, and some of the ones that come right underneath it have in common? They're all people-centric. They're all people-dependent. And uh, that's where, that's where uh, the problem happens. So we then went on and said, do you agree or disagree that automated classification is really the only way you're going to get there, the only way you're going to deal with these crazy volumes uh, coming up? And you definitely, uh, you definitely have um, seen um, the power in that automation. And we put your responses from five years ago uh, versus where we are today. So good job. Good job, everybody. 
And finally, um, plan for the overall life cycle seamlessly. Again, not everybody's going to care. Um, I know people whose eyes just glaze up when you say the word life cycle. And, you know, why not? It's it's pretty nebulous. And only certain people really appreciate the 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 uh, journey that that information travels throughout your processes and between processes. So, you know, don't expect everybody to get excited about it, but plan for it. Those of you who are experts in this area, plan for it and try to do it seamlessly. I remember uh, not long ago, one of our members from Raytheon said, I know I'm doing my governance job when my super users or my users overall don't know I'm doing my job. And I think that's really, really poignant. So the secret sauce isn't complete without this one last ingredient. And as we explained in the beginning, the approach that's deemed most effective by 30%, 36% of you is to approach information governance more obliquely, not just as an end in itself, but as a necessary element in a very specific process automation initiative. Even in an earlier survey, gosh, I think that was um, earlier this year, 58% of you agreed with this statement. And I quote, information governance is better sold indirectly as a byproduct of automation, there you go, Ian Robert, and customer experience than head on. So perhaps the greatest change that we at AIM have seen over the past five years has really been the increasing adoption of tools to automate that process and make governance as invisible as possible to your average knowledge workers. 53% of your organization see automation of information governance processes as highly important or a game changer. Again, let the machines now and some of these automation tools do the heavy lifting and um, let your knowledge workers focus on really mission critical and, dare I say, more sexy uh, kind of work that your executives will get excited about. So let's continue this uh, life cycle um, uh, topic for a moment. And with help from uh, our extended community of AIMers, and thank you so much, um, we've identified eight life cycle considerations that we really think um, will help you not only with your policies, but with that execution that Ian Robert talked about. Ask yourself who created or received the information. Uh, this could be a named user, a role, or a department. Who uses or accesses the information? And a tangent to that is how often. That's really important. So how is that information being used? Is it reference material for customer service? Is it synthesized with other information? What are all the various actions and activities that are dependent on it? I think that's really important. Um, who manages it? And the skeptic in me will say, does anybody manage it? Does anybody care? Um, those are all good <laughs> questions, particularly when you're looking at rot, um, uh, for sure. And does a particular piece of information live in more than one place? Is it in more than uh, one format or version? Prob probably so. So which one uh, should be the master? Uh, what formats are used to contain the information? Where is it physically located? That's a little less important right now. Um, I'm a firm believer in cloud. I don't believe cloud is any less secure uh, if, if done correctly and if um, uh, uh, consideration for the type of information. And then finally, what kinds of retention requirements govern the life cycle? This may sound uh, sacrilegious, but, you know, if your uh, retention requirements say something, you don't have to do more than that um, if that's going to contribute to your rot and, and your information overload. So mm -hmm. this is a big list. Um, what have I missed, Ian Robert? Um, any additional approach that you guys at Access take in considering – information from, you know, birth or acquisition to disposition and everything in between? What, what, what do you espouse? I, I think you hit them. I think you hit them all. 
if I could, I'd I'd like to I'd like to kind of go up a little higher um, and talk about like a Covey concept of first things first. Um, I'll point out that um, in, in my client experience, I'm often uh, engaged in in the management of the information assets. These things described here uh, on the slide, and th those are all huge, and 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 obviously. Uh, they're important. Um, one of the one of the things we're trying to lead um, is really making sure that <clears throat> we are all the client isn't uh, consumed and engaged in in a management process that um, they were handed or is a collection of tactical things that have kind of now come together to be how a company um, is is executing before they've actually gone through a process, a, a broad-based full team, and now we're into the uh, information governance team concept that really builds out the management tools and the processes um, that, that, that they've gained agreement on that will then become what they execute. So we see people executing but not having a firm grounding in uh, having built the management tools and processes. And so we really, um, we meet the client where they are, but we try to then uh, facilitate making sure they have a strong base um, around um, their information governance. So in doing that, Peggy, we find that um, information governance can now be uh, put in alignment with the business needs and goals. If these aren't established and clear and we don't have agreement on what those are, it's difficult then to align the information governance outcomes um, and end up with something most useful to execute in terms of managing it. A solid IG program balances ensuring information as a useful asset with the risks and liabilities associated with that information. That value and risk are going to change over time. The, the, the record, the data, and its value and its risk are going to change over time. Your plan needs to account for the full life cycle of that document. We have a client, um, we have a client where we receive their paper and digital invoices. We worked with them to determine the management tools and processes that they would need in order to meet all of their goals. And then we help them manage their information assets. At one, uh, one example of that is we extract information that they determined they needed from these physical and digital invoices, and then we, we export that into our client's financial systems. This process then creates a lower cost for invoice processing, a business outcome they desired. It also reduces errors and allows them to take full advantage of early pay discounts, other goals they had. We hold these invoices for the required retention period, and then we can quickly make them available if an audit is required. This, they also then reside and become um, actionable in destruction or deletion as part of the end of the life cycle. This is business alignment. The information in this case is invoice data, a useful asset, and we minimize the risk and liability information governance um, concerns around that invoice for its entire life cycle. So, Peggy, I, I've, I've enjoyed the dialogue. I'm really excited to see some of the questions that are coming and, and even after the fact, some of the, the interaction I'll get with our, with our community, um, things we've missed, things to add, maybe, maybe some stories where some of this content content has helped them. I think it's important um, that, you know, we, we now have a, a call to action. You know, there, there's got to be, you know, some action that takes place, I hope, uh, based upon, you know, something they learned or something you have said that's tweaked someone's, you know, thought process. So I, for me, you know, I hope if someone doesn't if they haven't been able to step back and form an IG perspective, if they're still in the records management silo, or if they are in IG but they haven't really stepped back to assess where where we're going next, what's our, our roadmap for 
uh, where to take our program next. I, I really hope that they'll look at these five ingredients uh, that we've presented here and create an action plan um, to implement them.